Chapter 7 The Ecology of Freedom How Farming First Hope Stumbled and Baffled and Bluffed Its Way Around the World. In a way, the further question of the Middle East is unusual precisely because we know so much about what happened there, long recognized as a crucible of plant and animal domestication. It has been more intensively studied by archaeologists than almost any other region outside Europe. This accumulation of evidence allow us to begin to tease out some of the social changes that accompanied the first steps to crop and animal domestication, even to rely a certain extent on negative evidence. It is difficult, for instance, to make any sort of convincing argument that welfare was a significant feature of early farming societies in the Middle East, as by now, as by now, one would expect some evidence for it to have shown up in the record. On the on the other hand, there is abundant evidence for the proliferation of trade and specialist crafts, and for the importance of female figures in art and ritual. For the same reasons. We are able to draw comparisons between the lowland part of the Fertile Crescent, especially the Levantine Corridor passing via the Jordan Valley in its, and its upland sector, the plains and foothills of eastern Turkey, where equally precocious developments in village life and local industries were associated with the raising of stone monuments adorned with masculine symbolism and unimaginable imagery of predatory violence. Some scholars have tried to see all these developments as somehow part of a single process heading in the same general direction towards the birth of agriculture. But the first farmers were reluctant farmers who seem to have understood to have understood the logistical implications of agriculture and avoided any major commitment to it. Their upland neighbors also living settled lived, lives in areas with diverse, with diverse wild resources had even less incentive to tie their existence to a narrow range of crops and livestock. If the situation in just one cradle of early farming was that, a compli was that complicated, then surely it no, less, it no longer makes sense to ask what were the social implications of the transition to farming, if there, as if there was necessarily just one transition and one set of implications. Certainly, it's wrong to assume that planting seeds or tending sheep means one is necessarily obliged to accept more un un unequal social arrangements simply to avoid a tragedy of commons of the commons. There is a paradox there here. Most general works of the course of human history do actually assume something like this, but almost nobody, if pressed, would seriously defend such a point because it's an abuse to men. Any student of agrarian societies knows that people inclined to expand agriculture sustainability, sustainably, sustainably without privatizing land or surrendering its management to a class of overseas have always found ways to do so. Communal tenor, open field principles, periodic redistribution of plots and cooperative management of pasture are not particularly exceptional and were often practiced for centuries in the same locations. The Russian mill is a famous example, but similar systems of land redistribution one once existed over all Europe for the highlands of Scotland to the Balkans occasionally into very recent times. The Anglo-Saxon times ran re of Randall. Of course, the rules of redistribution varied from one case to the next to the next. In some it was made for, for, for it was made per strips, for strips in others according in others according to the number of people in the in, in the family. Most of them the precise location of each trip was determined by lottery, which each family received, receiving one strip per land, track of the, or the, 
of differing quality so that nobody was obliged to travel much further than anyone than anyone else to he to his fields or to walk soil of consist consistently lower quality of course it wasn't just in europe that such things happened in his 18 in in his 1875 lectures on the on the early history of institutions henry sumner main who had the first chair of historical and comparative jurisprudence at oxford was already discussing cases of periodic land redistribution and randall type institution for Indi from india to ireland nothing that almost up until his own day cases were frequent in which the arable land was divided into farms which shifted among the tenant families periodically and sometimes annually and that in pre-industrial germany where land tenure was appropriate was appropriate apportioned between remark associations each tenant would receive lots divided among the three main qualities of soil importantly he knows there were not such more such there were not so much forms of property as modes of occupation not unlike the rights of accent of access found in many forager groups we could go on peeling we could go on peeling up the assemblies the palestinian mass art system for instance of balinus work in short there simply no, there simply no reason to assume that a uh, that the adoption of agriculture in more remote periods also meant the inception of private private land ownership territoriality ter territoriality or an or an irreversible departure from for egalitarianism it may have happened that way sometimes but this cannot can no longer be treated as a default assumption as we saw in the last chapter, is certainly the opposite seems true in the fertile question of the Middle East at the at least for the first few thousand years after the after the appearance of farming. If the situation in just one cradle of early farming was so different from our evolutionary expectations, then we can only wonder that other stories remains remain to be told in other places where farming emerged indeed these other locations are multiplying in light of new evidence genetic and botanical as well as archaeological it turns out the process was far messier and far less and indirectional than, uh, than anyone had guessed so, and so we have to consider a broader range of possibilities than was assumed in this chapter we saw just how much the picture in changing and point towards some of the surprising new patterns that are static that are starting to emerge geographers and historians used to believe that plants and animals were first domesticated in just a few nuclear zones the same areas in which large scale politically centralist societies later appeared in the Middle East, there was wheat and barley, as well as as well as sheep, goats, pigs, and cattle. In China, there was rice, japonica, soybeans, and a different variety of pigs, of pig, potatoes, quinoa, and llamas were brought under domestication in the Peruvian Andes, and maize, avocado, and chili in Mesoamerica such niche ge such neat geographical al alignments alignments between early centers of crop domestication and the rise of centralist states invited speculation that the former led to the latter that food production was responsible to the emergence of cities writing a centralist political organization providing a surplus of calories to support large populations and elite classes of administrators, warriors, and politicians. In fact, agriculture or so the story once went, and you set yourself on a course that will eventually lead to a Syrian karyotics, Confucian bureaucrats, in Kassan kings, of a, of a state priest carrying away a significant chunk of your, of your grain. Domination 
and most often violent, ugly domination was sure to follow. It was just a matter of time. Archaeological science has changed all this. Experts now identify between 15 and 20 independent centers of domestication, many of which follow very different paths of development of China to China, Peru, Mesoamerica, or Mesopotamia, which themselves all followed quite different paths, as we'll see in later chapters. To those centers of, of early farming must now be added, among others, the Indian subcontinent, where, where brown top millet, mung means horse gum, in, indica rice, and ham zebu cattle were domesticated. The grasslands of West America, pearl millet, the central highlands of New Guinea, bananas, taros, and yams, the tropical forests of South America, manioc, and peanuts, and the eastern woodlands of North America, where a distinct seed of lo a lo of a local seed crops, goose food, sunflower, and some wheat, and some wheat was raised long before the introduction of maize for Mesoamerica. We know how much less about the prehistory of these other regions than we do uh, than we do about the first question. None, uh, none follow a linear trajectory from food production to state formation, nor is there any reason to assume a rapid spread of farming beyond them to neighboring areas. Food production did not always present itself to foragers, fishers, and hunters as an obviously beneficial thing. Historians painting with a broad brush sometimes with a broad brush sometimes write as if it did as if it did or so as or as if the only barriers to the spread of farming were natural ones such as climate and topography. This sets up something of a paradox because even foragers living in highly suitable environments and clearly aware of the possibles of cereal farming often choose not to adopt it. Take Jared Diamond. Just as some just as some regions prove much more suitable than others for origins of food production, the ease of it the ease of its spread also very greatly around the world some areas that are ecologically very suitable of food production never acquired it in prehistoric times at all, even though areas of prehistoric food product even though areas of prehistoric food production existed nearby. The most consp conspicuous such examples the failure of the food farming and heading to rich Native American California from the US Southwest or to rich Australia from the New Guinea and Indonesia and the value of farming to spread from South America's natal province to South, Af to South Africa's Cape. As we saw in Chapter 5, the value of, uh, the value of farming to rich California is not a particularly compelling way to frame the problem. This is just an this is just an updated version of the old diffusion approach, which indeed identifies culture traits, catch cradles, musical instruments, agriculture, and so on, and maps out how they how they migrate across the globe and why in some places they fail to do so. In reality, there's every reason to believe that farming reached California just as soon as it just as soon as it reached anywhere else in North America. It's just that this is it just that despite a work ethic that follows Tenos labor and a regional exchange system that would have a lot of information about innovations to spread rapidly, people that rejected this practice as, as definitely as they did slavery. Even in the American Southwest, the overall trend for 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 five hundred for for five hundred years or so before European Europeans arrived was the gradual abandonment of maize and beans, which people 
had been going in some cases for thousands of years and returned to a foraging way of life. If anything, during this period, Californians were the ones doing the spreading with populations or originally from the east of the state bringing new foraging techniques and replacing previously agricultural peoples as far as far away as Utah and Wyoming. By the time Spaniards arrived in the southwest, that the Pueblo societies which had once dominated the region were reduced, were reduced to isolated pockets of farmers entirely surrounded by hunter-gatherers. On some issues of terminology when discussing the movement of domestic crops and animals around the globe, in books on world history, you often encounter phrases like crops and livestock spread rapidly to, Euro to Eurasia of the plant package of the Fertile Crescent launched food production from Ireland to the Indus or mass diffused northwards at the snail space. How appropriate is such language when describing the expansion of Neolithic economies that many thousands of years ago? If anything, it seems to reflect the experience of the last few centuries when old world, when old world domesticates did, did indeed conquer the environments of the America, of the Americas and Oceania. In those more recent times, crops and livestock were able to spread like wildfire, transforming existing habitats in ways that often rendered them unrecognizable within a few generations. But this, but this has less to do with the nature of seed cultivation itself than with, the imper with imperial and commercial expansion. Seed can spread very quickly if those carrying them have an army and are driven by the need endlessly to expand their enterprises to maintain profits. The Neolithic situation was altogether different, especially for the first several thousand years after the end of the last age, ice, age, ice Age. Most people were still not farmers and farmers' crops had to compete with a whole pan panoply with, of white predators and parasites, most of which have since been have since been eliminated from agricultural landscapes. To begin with, domestic plants and animals could not spread beyond their original ecological limits without significant effort on the plant on the part of their human planters and keepers. Suitable environments not only had to be found but also modified by weeding, manuring, tracing, and so on. The landscape modifications in fourth may, may in fourth may seem small scale little more than ecological tinkering to our eyes but they were but they were one was enough by local standards and crucial is but and crucial in extending the range of domestic species of course there were always parts of least resistance topographical features and climatic regimes conducive or less conducive to the, neo to the Neolithic economy, the east-west axis of Eurasia discussed by Jared Diamond in his guns, gems, and steel, or the lucky latitudes of Ian, of Ian Morris, why the West rules for now, 2010, and are ecological corridors of this sort. Eurasia, as this authors point out, point out has few equivalents to the sublimatic variations of the Americas or indeed of Africa. Terrestrial species can travel across the breadth of the Eurasian continent, continent without, without crossing boundaries within tropical and temperate zones. Continents whose extremities did not to sort are a different proposition and perhaps less amenable to such ecological transfers. The basic, the basic geographical point is certainly sound, at least for the last 10,000 years of history. It explains why cereals of the Christian origin are successfully grown today 
in such distant locations as Ireland and Japan. It may also explain to some extent why many thousands of years why many thousands of years years elapsed be, before American crops such as maize of square, squares first domesticated in the tropics were accepted in the temperate northern part of the American continent. By contrast with the relatively rap rapid adoption of Eurasian crops outside their areas of origin. To what extent can such observations help to make sense of human history on a larger scale? How far geography go in explaining history rather than simply informing rather than simply informing it? Back in the 1970s and 1980s, a geographical court Alfred W. Cosby came up with, the num with a number of important theories about how ecology shaped the, con the course of history. Among other, among other things, he was the first to draw attention to the Columbian Exchange, the remarkable crossover of non-human species spread in motion by European by motion by Europeans arrival in the Ameri in the Americas after 1492 and its transformative effect on the global configuration of culture, economy and season, tobacco, peppers, potatoes and turkeys flowed into Eurasia, maize, rubber and chickens enter Africa and citrus woods, coffee, horses, donkeys and livestock travel to the Afri Americas. Crosby went on the went on to argue that the global ascendance of, of European economies since the 16th century could be accounted by, for by a process he called ecological imperialism. The temperate zones of North, Amer of North America and Oceania, as Cosby pointed, po pointed out, were ideally treated by two Eurasian crops and livestock not only because of their climate, but because of the possess, but because they possess few negative competitors and no local parasites such as the various fungus, insects, and field mice that have developed to specialize in sharing human ground with, unless on such fresh environments, all were domesticated, went into reproductive overdrive, even going viral again in some cases. Outgrowing and outgrazing local flora and fauna, they began to turn narrative ecosystem on their heads, creating neo -Europe, ne neo -Europe, Europe's carbon copies of European environments of the sort one sees today when driving to the countryside of New Zealand's North, of New Zealand's North Island, for example, of much of for example of much New England. The ecological salt on, on native habitats also included effective also included infectious diseases such as smallpox and measles, which originated in the in old world in old world environments where humans and cattle cohabited. While European plants thrive in the absence of pests, diseases broke with domestic animals or by humans accustomed to living alongside with them. Wreck havoc on indigenous popul population, creating casualty, casualty, creating casualty rates as high as 95%. Even in places where settlers were not enslaving or actively mass massacring the indigenous population, which of course they often were. Few in dislike the success, the success of modern Europe imperialism out more to the out more to the old world neolithic revolution with its good with its roots in the further question to the specific achievements of Columbus, Magellan, Cook and all the rest. And in and in a sense this this, this is true. 
but the story of agricultural expansion before the 16th century is very far from being a from being a one way a one way state. In fact, this world of far of false starts, hiccups, and reversals. This, this becomes true for the, the, the further back we go in time to appreciate why we will have to look beyond the Middle East to consider how the earliest farming populations were in some other points of the world after the end of the last ice age. But first, there is a more basic point to address. Why is our discussion of these issues confined only, the, only to the last 10,000 or so years of human history, given that humans have been around for upwards of 200,000 years? Why did the, why did farming develop much earlier? Why agriculture did not develop sooner? Since our species came into existence, there have been only two sustained periods of warming cl of warm climate of the kind that might support an agricultural economy for long enough to lo to leave some trace in the ecological record. The first was the Imian interglacial, which took place around one one hundred thirty thousand years ago. Global temperatures stabilized at slightly above the present day levels, sustaining the spread of burgers burgers as far as far north as Alaska and Finland. He pushed back on the banks of the Tamis and the Rhin, but the impact by the impact of on human population, but the impact of human populations was limited by our then the our then restricted geographical range. The second is the one we are living in now, when it began uh, around 12,000 years ago, people were already present on all the world's continents and in many different kinds of environment. Geologists, geologists call this period the Holocene, from Greek Holos, entire and Kainos new. Many Earth scientists now consider the Holocene over and undone, for at least the last two centuries we have been entering a new neological epoch. The Anthropocene, in which for the first time in history, human, act human activities are the main, driver, are, are the main dri drivers of global climate change. Where exactly the Anthropocene begins is a scientific bone of contention. Most experts point to the industrial revolution, but some put its origins earlier in the late 1500s and early 1600s. At the time, a, at the time, a global drop, a global drop in surface and the air temperatures occurred. Part of the Little Ice Age, which natural forces can be can explain. Quite likely, European expansion in the Americas play a role. With perhaps ninety, with perhaps ninety percent of the indigenous population eliminated by the effect of conquest and infectious disease, forests reclaim regions in which the rest agricultural irrigated irrigation has been practiced for centuries. In Mesoamerica, Amazonia, and the, and the Andes, some 50 million hectares of cultivated land might have reverted to wilderness. Carbon uptake for pump vegetation increased, increased on, a, on a scale suffic sufficient to change the earth system and bring about a human-driven phase of global, of global cooling. Where one started, the Anthropocene is what we have done with legacy of Holocene age, which in some ways had been a clean sheet for humanity as its onset. Many things really well knew. As the ice receded, flora and fauna won't confine to small revisions spread out to the new vistas. People followed, helping forward species on their way 
by setting fires and clearing land. The effect of global warming on the world's salt lines was more complex as coastal shifts, as coastal shifts formerly under ice sprang back to the surface, with other sinks, with other sinks be below rich sea waters fed from glacial melt, fed from glacial melt. For many historians, the onset, the onset of the Holocene is significant because it created conditions for the origins of agriculture, yet in many parts of the world, as we've, as we've already seen, it was also a golden age for foragers, and it's important to remember that this forager paradise was the context in which the first farmers set up shop. The most vigorous expansion of foraging populations was in coastal environments, freshly exposed by, by glacial retreat. Such locations offered abundance of wild resources, saltwater fish and seabirds, whales and dolphins, seals and other and otters, crabs, shrimps, oysters, periwinkles and more besides. Fresh water, fresh water rivers and lagoons fed by mountain glaciers now teem with pike and beam and brim attracting migratory waterfall. Around estuaries, deltas and lake margins, annual annual rounds of fishing and foraging took place at increasingly close range, leading to sustained patterns of human aggregation quite unlike those of the glacial period when when long seasonal migrations of mammoths and other large game such as much of social life. Scrub and forest replace open steppe and tundra across much of this post-glacial world. As in earlier times, foragers used various techniques of land management to stimulate the growth of desired species, such as wood and nut bearing trees. And nut bearing trees by egg by 8,000 BC, their efforts had contributed to the extension, to extension of roughly two, two thirds of two of the world's megafauna, which were ill suited to the to the warmer and more enclosed habitats of the Holocene. Expanding woodlands offered a superabundance of nutritious and storable foods, wild nuts berries, fruits, leaves, and fungi, processed with a new suite of composite mycolytic tools. When forest, took, when forest took over from step, human hunting techniques shifted from, shifted from the seasonal coordination of mass kills to more opportunistic and versatile strategies focused on small mammals with more limited home range. Among the among them elk, deer, boar, and white cattle. What is easy to forget, with hindsight, is that the farmers entered into the whole new world very much as the as the cultural underdogs. Their earliest expansions were about as far removed as one could imagine from the ima from the missions civil civil trees of modern agrarian empires, mostly. As we'll see, they fill in the they fill in the territorial gaps left behind by foragers, geographical species either too remote, inaccessible, or simply undesirable to attract the sustained attention of hunters, fishers, and gatherers. Even in such locations, these earlier economies in the Holocene would have decidedly mixed fortunes. Now. Is this more dramatically illustrated than in the early Neolithic period of Central Europe, where farming endured one of its of its first and most conspicuous failures? To better understand the reasons why this failure occurred, we will then consider some more successful expansions of early farming populations in Africa, Oceania, and the tropical lowlands of South America. Historically speaking, there is no direct connection among these, these cases, but what they saw 
but what they show collectively is how the fate of early farming societies often hinge less on ecological imperialism than on what we might call to adapt afresh from the pioneer of social ecology, Murray Burchin, and ecology of freedom. By this, we mean something quite specific if patients are people extensively involved in cultivation. Then, the ecology of freedom by farming, in short, is precisely the opposite condition. The ecology of freedom describes the, poly the proclivity of human societies to move freely to move freely in out in and out farming so far without fully becoming farmers raised crops and animals without surrounding too much of one's extensive existence to the logistic rigors of agriculture and retain a food and retain a food web sufficiently broad as to prevent cultivation from becoming a matter of life and death it is just this sort of ecological flexibility that tends to be excluded from conventional narratives to na conventional narratives of world history which present the planting of a single seed as a point of no return. Moving freely in and out of farming in this way of hovering on this threshold turns out to be turns out to be something our species has done successfully for a larger part of its past. Such fluid ecological arrangements, combining gardens cultivation, flood retreat, flood retreat farming on the margins of the la of lakes of springs, small-scale landscape management, e.g. by burning, pruning and terracing, and the corralling of keep or keeping of animals in semi-wild states, combined with a spectrum of hunting, fishing and collecting activities, were once typical of human societies in many parts of the world. Often these activities were sustained for those at work thousands of years and not infrequently supports large populations. As we'll see, they may also have been crucial to the, to the survival of those with human populations to incorporate domesticated plants and animals. Biodiversity, not biopower, was the initial key to the god of Neolithic food and production in which we consider a Neolithic cautionary tale, the grisly and surprising fate of Central Europe's first farmers, Killian Staten, Talheim, Schletz, and, he and Hexheim, are all, the name, are all names of early Neolithic sites of the Lost Plains of Austria and Germany. Collectively, they tell a very unfamiliar story of early agriculture, in these places, starting, about, starting around 5500, 5500 BC, villages of a similar cultural outlook known, known as the Linear Pottery Tradition were established. They are among the villages of Central Europe first farmers. But unlike most, but unlike most other early farming settlements, each ended its life in a period of turmoil marked by the digging and filling of mass graves. The contents of these graves attest to the annihilation or attempted annihilation of entire of an entire community coolly dark trenches or reused ditches containing chaotic jumbles of human remains, including adults and children of both sexes, disposed of like so much refuse. Dark ones Dark ones so the telltale marks of torture, mutilation, and violent death, the breaking of limbs, ticking the ticking of scalps, butchering of war cannibalism. A Killian Staten and Aspan, younger women were missing from the assemblage, suggesting their appropriation as captives. The Neolithic farming economy had arrived in Central Europe, carried by migrants from the southwest from the southwest. And with, ulti and with ultimately catastrophic consequences for some of those host ancestors broke it there. The earliest settlements of these newcomers to the central European plains suggest a relatively free society with few indicators of status difference either, be either within or between communities. 
the basic family units timber long houses were all about approximately the same size but around 5000 bc disparities began to appear between them are also in the kind of goods place with their dead people enclosed their settlements within large ditches which lead, which lead evidence of welfare in the forms of arrows axe heads and human remains in some cases when the sites were overrun these ditches were turned into mass graves for the residents they had failed to defend such is the quality of such is the quality and quantity of accurately date, dated material that researchers are able to model demographic trends accompanying these changes these changes the reconstructions have come as something of a surprise the arrival of farming in central europe the reconstruction of the arrival of farming the arrival of farming in central europe was associated with an initial and quite massive upsurge in population which is, is which is of course exactly what will what one will expect but what followed was not anticipated up and up up and up pattern of demographic growth instead came a disastrous downturn a boom and bust between 5000 5, and 400 400 5000 bc 5000 5, and 5 and 400 5000 5, and 5400 5500 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, bc are something approaching a regional collapse these early neolithic groups arrived they settled and then in many but we should and persist not all areas their numbers dwell in, in obscurity while in others they were boasted through intermediates with more established forager populations only after hiatus of roughly 1000 years did extensive cereal farming take off again in central and northern europe older narratives of prehistory tended simply to assume that neolithic colonies held the upper hand over native foraging populations demographically and socially that they either replaced them or converted them to a superior way of life through trade inter and intermarriage the boom and bus the boom and bus pattern of early farming now they co document in temperate europe contradicts this picture and raises wider questions about the viability of neolithic economies in a world of foragers to address these questions we need to know a bit more about the foraging populations themselves and how they develop the pleistocene the pleistocene traditions after the ice age and into the holocene much of what we know about post-glacial mesolithic forager populations in europe derives from findings from findings along the baltic and atlantic coast much more much more is lost to the sea we learn a great deal about these holocene hunter foragers from their funerary funerary custom funerary customs from northern russia to through scandinavia and down to the britain coast they are illuminated by finds of prehistoric cemeteries quite often the burials were richly adorned in the baltic and iberian regions they include copious and amounts of amber corpses like lie in the striking in striking postures sitting or learning even flip even flip on their heads suggested suggesting people and now largely un unfathomable gods of hierarchy on the fringe of northern eurasia pit box and water log site preserve glimpses of a wood carving of a wood carving tradition that produced decorated sky runners sages canals and monuments resembling the totem poles of the pacific northwest coast staffs topped with earth and rinder effigies reminiscent of places and rock art depictions appear often broad areas a stable symbolism of authority crossing the boundaries of local foraging groups 
how did Europe's deep interior, where it coming farmers settled, look from the vantage point of these established majority populations? Most probably, like most probably, like an ecological dead end, lacking the obvious advantages of coastal environments. It may be, it may have been precisely this that allowed linear boundary colonies to spread freely west and not on the losses loss points to begin with. They were moving into areas with little or no prior occupation, whether that reflects a conscious policy or affording local foragers is unclear. What's clearer is that what's clearer is that this wave of advance began to break as the new farming groups approach and approach most densely populated coastlands. What exactly this might what exactly this might have meant in practice is often ambiguous. For example, human remains of coastal foragers found on make specialty sites in Brittany saw so, anomalous levels of terrestrial protein in the diet of many young females contrasting with the general prevalence of marine foods among the rest of the population. It seems that women of inland origin until then until the who until then had been eating largely meat not fish were joining coastal groups what does this tell what does this tell us it may indicate that women had been captured and transported in raids conceivably including raids by foragers on farming communities this can only be speculative we cannot know we cannot know for sure that women move in follow involuntarily or even that they move at the bare behest of men and while reading of and, and while reading and warfare were clearly part of the picture it will be simplistic to attribute the initial value of neolithic farming in europe to such factors alone we'll consider some broad explanations in due course first though we should we should take a reprieve from Europe and examine some of the success stories of early farming, we will start with Africa, with Africa, then move on to Oceania, and lastly the rather different of an instructive case of Amazonia. Some very different places where Neolithic farming found its feet, the transformation of the Nile Valley, circa 5000 until 4000 BC, and the colonization of island Oceania circa 1600 until 500 BC. Around that time, the linear boundary settlements were established in Central Europe. The Neolithic farming economy made its first appearance in Africa. The African, the African variant had the same ulti ultimate origin in the southwest in Southwest Asia. It comprised the same basic suits, suite of crops, emerald and encon, and animals, dom and animals, domestic sheep, goats and cattle, with perhaps some admixture of local African aurochs. Yet the African reception of this Neolithic package could not have been more different. It is almost as if the first African farmers opened up the package threw out some of the contents, the re then rewrap it in such regularly distinct ways that one could easily mistake for a completely local invention, as in many ways it was. The place where much of this happened was a region largely ignored by foragers until then, but soon to become a major axis of demographic and political change. The political change. The Nile Valley of Egypt and Sudan by 3000, 3000 BC, the political integration of its lower, of its lower reaches with the, with the Nile Delta would produce the first territorial kingdom of ancient Egypt facing the Mediterranean. However, the cultural roots of this and all later Neolithic civilizations lay in much earlier transformations linked to the adoption of farming between 5000 and 4000 BC 
with the center of gravity more firmly in Africa. These first African farmers reinvented the Neolithic in their own image. Cereal cultivation was relegated to a minor pursuit, regaining its status, regaining its status on the centuries later. And the idea that one's social identity, uh, that one's social identity, identity was represented by hut and home, and home was largely thrown out too. In their place came a quite different Neolithic supple, supple, vibrant, and traveling on the hoof. This new form of Neolithic economy relied heavily on livestock herding combined with annual runs of fishing, hunting, and foraging on the rich boat plain of the Nile and in the oasis and seasonal streams or wadis of what are of what are now the neighboring deserts, which were then start and then still watered by annual rains. Herders moved periodically in and out of this green Sahara, both west and east to the Red Sea coast. Complex systems of bodily display develop. New, form, new forms of personal adornment employed cosmetic pigments and minerals prospected for prospected from the adjacent desserts, and a distinct array of bedwork, combs, bangles, and other ornaments made of ivory and bone, all richly attested in Neolithic cemeteries running the length of the Nile Valley from Central Sudan to Middle Egypt. What survives today of this amazing gear now graces the shelves on museum displays of the world over reminding us that before these pharaohs, almost only one could hope to be buried like a king, queen, prince of princes. Another of the world's great Neolithic expansions took place in island Oceania. Its origins lay at the, at the other end of Asia in the rice and millet growing cultures in Taiwan and the Philippines, the deeper roots are in China. Around 1600 BC, a striking dispersal of farming groups took place, starting here and ending over 5000 miles to the east in Polynesia, known as the Lapita Horizon, after the site in the New Caledonia where its decorated pottery was first identified. This precocious expansion, which caught into being the world's first deep ocean outreach, or regional canals is often connected to the spread of Austronesian languages. Rice and millet, poorly suited to tropical climates, were jettisoned in its early stage of dispersal. But as the Lapita horizon advanced, their place was taken by a rich atmosphere of tubers and fruit crops and counted along the way. Together with a growing managerie, of image of animal domesticates, pigs joined by dogs and chickens, rats to hitch along from for the ride. This species traveled with Lapita colonies to previously un in uninhabited islands, among them Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa, where they put down roots, quite literally, in the case of taro and other tubers. Like the line, like the linear pottery farmers of Central Europe, Lapita groups seem to have avoided established centers of population. They gave a wide berth to the forager stronghold of Australia and skirted largely clear of Papua New Guinea, where a local form of farming was already was established in up in the uplands around the Wagi Valley. On Virgin Islands, on Virgin Islands, and beside and beside Falcon Lagoons, they founded their villages, compressing houses perched on stilts, with, st with stone and chase, a mainstay, a mainstay of their traveling toolkit, they clear patches of forest to make gardens for their crops, tigers, yams, and bananas, which they supplemented with animal domesticates and a rich diet of fish shellfish and marine turtles with white birds and fruit bats. 
and let Europe suffer from us. The carries, the, the carries of the Lapita horizon diversified the, the economy, the economy continuously as they spread. And this was not just true of their crops and animals, for aging is what Lapita peoples left a trail of distinctive pottery, the most consistent signal in the archaeological record. Along the way, they also encountered many, many new materials. The most valued, such as particular types of shell, were crafted into multimedia ornaments, arm rings, necklaces, pendants, which left a trace on Melanesian and Polynesian island culture that was still visi visible many centuries later. When Captain Cook, unwittingly retracing the steps of Lapita, caught sight of New Caledonia in 1774 and wrote that it reminded him of Scotland. Lapita prestige items also include bird feeder headdresses depicted on the pottery, fine pandanus leaf mats, and obsidian, obsidian blades circulating thousands of miles away from the sources in the Bisma archipelago were used in tattooing and scarification to apply pigment and plant matter to their skin. While the tattoos themselves do not survive, the impressed decoration of Lapita pots give some hint of the underlying schema transferred from the skin to ceramic. Most recent traditions of Polynesian tattooing and body art wrapping the body in images and image as a form of anthropological study puts it remind us how little we really know of the vibrant conceptual words of earlier times and those who first carried such practices across remote Pacific Islandscapes. On the case of Amazonia and the possibilities of play, play farming. On first inspection, these three variations of the Neolithic European, African, Oceanian, European, African, Oceanic might seem to have almost nothing in common. However, all serve two important features. First, it involves a serious commitment to farming of the tree. The linear pottery culture of Europe and Mesh itself most deeply in the raising of cereals and livestock. The Nile, the, the Nile Valley was fully was fully ready to its heads, as was the Lapita to its pigs and yams. In every case, the species in question was fully domesticated, reliant on human intervention for its survival, and was no longer able to reproduce unassisted, unassisted in the wild. For their part, the people in question had oriented their lives around the needs of certain plants and animals, enclosing, protecting, and breeding those species was a perennial feature of their existence and a cornerstone of their diets. All of them had become serious farmers. Second, all this case involved a targeted spread of farming to lands largely un un uninhabited by existing populations. The highly mobile nullity of Nile Valley extended seasonally into the adjacent of steep desert, but the further regions that were already densely shattered, such as the Nile Delta, the Sudanese Kizira, and the major oasis, including the Fayum, where light side of where light side fish of forages prevailed, adopting it, adopting and abandoning farming practices largely as seed seeded for them. Similarly, the linear pottery culture of Europe took root in niches in niche left, opened by mesolithic foragers, such as patches of loose soil and unused rifle fillies. The Lapita Horizon, too, was a relatively closed system, interacting with others, interacting with others when necessary, but otherwise unfolding new resources into its own pattern of life. Serious farmers tended to form societies with hard boundaries, ethnic, and in some cases also linguistic. But not all early farming expressions were of this serious variety. In the lowland tropics of South, Asia, South, Africa, South America, archaeological research 
has uncovered a distinctly more playful tradition of hollow seed food production, simi food production similar practices. They were still widely in evidence in Amazonia until recently, such as we found among the Nambiguara of Brazil, Ma Brazil's Mato, Mato Grosso region. Well into the 20th century, they spent the rainy season in the riverside villages, clearing, clearing gardens and orchards to grow a panoply of crops, including sweet, including sweet and bitter manioc, maize, tobacco, beans, cotton, granuts, goats, and more besides. Cultivation was a relaxed affair, with little effort spent on keeping different species apart. And as the dry season commenced, this tangled house gardens were abandoned altogether. The entire group dispersed into small nomadic bands to hunt and forage, only to begin the whole process again the following year, often in a different location. In Greater Amazonia, such seasonal, such seasonal move, moves in and out of farming are documented among a wide range of indigenous societies and are of considerable antiquity. So is the habit of keeping pets. It is often stated that Amazonia has no indigenous animal domesticates and from a biological standpoint this is true. From a cultural perspective, things look more complicated. Many rainforest groups carry with them what can, what can only be described as a small zoo comprising them, them forest creatures, monkeys, parrots, colored bergaris, and so on. These pets are often the open offspring of the of animals hunted and killed over food, taken in by human forest parents, fed and nurtured to infancy. They become utterly dependent on their masters. This subservience lasts into into maturity. Pets are not eaten, nor are their keepers interested in breeding them. They live as individual members of the community who treat them much like children, as subjects of affection and sources of amusement. Amazonian societies blur our conventional distinction between wild and domestic in other ways. Animals, they routinely, ha they routinely hunt and capture for food including in good bakery, a goodie, and others, and others we would classify ice as wild. Yet these yet this same species are locally considered as already domesticated, at least in the sense of being subjects of super, supernatural masters of the animals, who protect them, and to whom they are bound, master or mistress of the, the animals. Hijacks are actually very common in hunting societies. Sometimes they take the form of a hood of one perfect specimen of a certain type of beast, a kind of embodiment of the species, but are, but at the same time they appear as human or women like donors of the species to whom the soul to whom the source of all deer or seals or caribou must be returned after hunters take them. In Amazonia, what this means in practice is that people avoid intervening in the reproduction of those particular species, this lest they usurp, lest they, us, they usurp the, the role of spirits. In other words, there was no obvious cultural root. There was no obvious cultural root in Amazonia that might lead humans to become both the primary carriers the primary carriers for and for and consumers of the other species relationships were either too remote in the case of game or too intimate in the case of pets. We are dealing here we are dealing here with people who possess all the requisite ecological skills to raise crops and livestock, but who nevertheless pull back from the threshold, maintaining a careful balancing balancing act between forager, or better perhaps forester and farmer. Amazonia shows 
how this in and out of farming game could be far more than a transient affair. It seems to have played out over thousands of years since during that time there's evidence of plant domestication and land management but little room commitment to agriculture. From 500 BC, this neotropical mode of food production expanded from its heartlands of the Orinoco and Rio Negro, tracking river systems to the rainforest and ultimately becoming established all the way from Bolivia to the Antilles. Its legacy is clearest in the distribution of living and historical groups speaking languages of the Arawak family. Arawak speaking groups were famed in recent centuries as master blenders of culture, threats, traders and diplomats forging diverse alliances, often for commercial advantage. Over 2000 years ago, a similar process of strategic cultural mixing quite unlike the avoidance strategies of more serious farmers seems to have brought about the convergence of the Amazon basin into a regional system. Arawak languages and their derivatives are spoken all along the Varsa, Varsia, alluvial traces from the mouths of the Orinoco and Amazon to the Peruvian headwaters, but their uses have little in the way of said genetic ancestry. The various dialects are structurally closer to those of their known Arawak neighbors than to each other or to any putative or language. The impression is not at all of a uniform spread, but targeted interweaving of groups along the main routes, routes of Canoborne of Cano, Cano -born transport and trade. The result was interlaced network of cultural exchange. Lacking, lacking clear boundaries of a, cent of a center. The latest work schema on Amazonian pottery, cotton fabrics, and skin painting recurring in strikingly similar styles from one edge of the rainforest to the other seem to model these connective principles entangling human bodies in a complex cartography of relations. Until quite recently, Amazonia was regarded as a timeless refuge of solitary tribes, about a class to Warsaw or Hobbes state of nature as one could possibly get. As we've seen, such romantic notions persisted in anthropology well into the 1980s. Two studies that cast groups like the Yanomami in the role of contemporary ancestors windows onto our, revolution, our revolutionary past. Research in the field of archaeology and ethnohistory is now overturning this picture. We now know that by the beginning of, Christian, of the Christian era, the Amazonian landscape was already studied with, town, with towns, terraces, monuments, and roadways reaching all the way from the highland kingdoms of Peru to the Caribbean. The first European to arrive there in the 16th century described life plan settlements, gov settlements governed by Paramount ships who dominated, who dominated their neighbors. It is tempting to, to dismiss the, uh, this accounts as a venturous hyperbole designed to impress the sponsors at home, but as archaeological science brings the outlines of this rainforest civilization into view, it is increasingly difficult to do so. Partly, this new understanding is the result of control research, partly a consequence of industrial deforestation which in the upper Amazon basin, looking west to Durandes, has exposed from the canopy of tradition of monumental works executed to precise geometrical plans and linked by road systems. What exactly was the reason for this ancient, ancient Amazonian efflorescence? Up until a few decades ago, 
all these developments were explained as the result of yet another agricultural revolution. It was supposed that in the first millennium BC, intensified manioc farming raised Amazonian population levels, generating a wave of human expansion throughout the lowland tropics. The basis for this hypothesis lay in front of domesticated manioc dating back as early 7000 BC, most recently in southern Amazonia, the cultivation of maize and squash has been traced back to similarly early periods. Yet there is little evidence for widespread farming of these crops in the key period of cultural convergence beginning around 500 BC. In fact, manioc only seems to have become a staple crop, of, crop after European contact. All this implies that at least some early inhabitants of Amazonia were well aware of land domestication but did not select it as the basis of their economy opting instead of for a more flexible kind of agroforestry. Modern rainforest agriculture relies on slash and burn techniques, labor intensive methods geared to the extensive cultivation of a small number of crops. The more ancient mode, which, we, which we've been describing, allowed for a much wider range of cultivars grown in those steppe gardens or small forest clearing clearings close to settlements. Such, such ancient plant nurseries rested on special soils or more strictly on those soils which are locally called Terra Preta de Indio, Black Earth of the Indians and Terra Mulata Brown Earth, Dark Earth with carrying capacities well in excess of ordinary tropical soils. The Dark Earth are the, are the readily to absorption of organic products such as food residues, excrement and charcoal from everyday villages, village life forming the Raspetas and all earlier episodes of localized burning and cultivation terras mulatas. Soil enrichment in ancient Amazonia was a slow and ongoing process, not an, an, not an annual task. Ply farming of this sort in the Amazon as, as elsewhere has had its recent advantages for indigenous peoples, elaborate and unpredictable subsistence routines are an excellent deterrent against the colonial state. The ecological the, an ecology of freedom in a literal sense. It is difficult to tax and monitor and monitor a group that refuses to stay in one location obtaining its life livelihood livelihood without making long-term commitments to fixed resources or growing much of its food in, 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 invisibly underground as with tubers and other roots vegetables. While this may be so, the deeper history of the American tropics shows that similarly loose and flexible patterns of food production sustain civilizational growth on a continent wide scale long before European arrive. In fact, farming of this particular sort, low-level food production, is the more technical term, has characterized a very wide, a very wide range of Holocene societies, including the earliest cultivators of the Celtic Crescent and Mesoamerica. In Mexico, domestic forms of squash and maize existed by 7000 BC, yet these crops only become stable foods around 5000 years later. 5000 years later, similarly in the eastern woodland of North America, local seed crops were cultivated by 3000 BC, but there was no serious farming until around AD 1000. China follows as was a similar pattern. Millet farming began 
on a small scale around 8000 BC on the northern plains as a seasonal complement to foraging and assisted hunting. It remained so 40,000 years until the introduction of cultivated millets into the basin of Yellow River. Similarly, on the lower and middle reaches of the Yangtze, fully domesticated rice strains only appear 15 centuries after the fir first cultivation of white rice in paddy in paddy in paddy fields. It might have been even taken longer were it were it not for a snap of global cooling around 5000 BC, which depleted white rice stands and nut harvests. Harvest. In both parts of China, long after the domestication peaks, still came second to white bog and deer in terms in of their, their significance. This was also the case in the wooden in the wooded upland of the Velte Crescent, when Sayonu, with its house of skulls, is located, and where human peak relations long remain more a matter of filtration, flirtation than full domestic domestication. So while it's tempting to hold Amazonia up as a new world alternative to the old Neolithic, the truth is that Holocene developments is in both hemispheres, hemispheres are starting to look increasingly similar, at least in terms of the overall pace of change, and in both cases, they look increasingly unrevolutionary. In the beginning, many of the world's farming societies were Amazonian in spirit. They hovered at the threshold of agriculture while remaining wedded to the cultural values of hunting and foraging. The similar, the smiling fields of Rosso's discourse still lay, still lay far off in the future. It may be, it, it may be that further research reveals demographic fluctuations among early farming or forester farmer populations in Amazonia, Oceania, or even among the first herding peoples of the Nile Valley, similar to those who observed for Central Europe, indeed some sort of decline, or at least major reconfiguration of settlement took place in the Vertical Crescent itself during the 7th millennium BC. At any rate, we shouldn't be too categorical about the contrast among these various regions, given the different amounts of evidence available for each. Still, based on what is currently known, we can at least reframe our initial question and ask, why did Neolithic farmers in certain parts of Europe initially saw the population collapse on a scale currently unknown and detected elsewhere? Clues lie in the thinness of the details. Shell farming, as it turns out, underwent some important changes during its transfer from Southwest Asia to Central Europe via the Balkans. Originally, there were three kinds of wheat and corn emmer and free dressing, and two kinds of barley, hold and neck, under cultivation, but also five different pieces, pea, lentil, bitter fetch, chickpea, and grass pea. By contrast, the majority of linear pottery sites contain just gloom wets, emmer and, and corn, and one or two kinds of pulse the Neolithic economy had become increasingly narrow and uniform and the mini subset of the Middle Eastern original. Furthermore, the loose landscapes of, of Central Europe offer like little topographical variability and a few opportunities to add new resources, while dense forager populations limited expansion towards the coast. Almost everything, almost everything came to revolve around around a single foot, foot web for Europe's earliest farmers. Cereal farming fed the community. Its byproducts, chaff and straw, provided food for their, for their animals, as well as basic materials for construction 
including timber for pottery and dab for horses, livestock to supply occasional meat, dairy and, food, dairy and wool, as well as manure for gardens, with the water and dab long horses and sparse, mat and sparse material culture. The first European farming settlements bear a peculiar resemblance to the rural peasant societies of much later eras. Most likely, they were also subject to some of the same weakness, not just periodic raiding from the, from the outside, but also internal labor countries, soil exhaustion, dis soil exhaustion disease, and harvest values across a whole spring of like for like communities with little scope for mutual aid. Neolithic farming was an experiment that could fail and on occasion did. Why did does why but why does it all matter? A quick repass on the dangers on tele theological reasoning. On this chapter we have tracked the feet of some of the world's first farmers as they hop, stumble, stumbled, and buffed and bluffed their way around the globe with mixed success. But what does this tell us about the overall course of human history? Surely, the skeptical reader might object what matters in the wider scheme of things are not the first faltering steps towards agriculture but its long-term effects. After all, by no later than 2000 BC, agriculture was supporting, the, was supporting great cities from China to the Mediterranean, and by 500 BC, food producing societies of one sort of another had colonies pretty much of all Eurasia, with the exception of Southern Africa, the subarctic region, and and, and a handful of subtropical islands. A skeptic might continue. Agriculture alone could unlock the carrying capacity of lands that foragers were either unable or unwilling to exploit to anything like this, like, like the same degree. So long as people were willing to give up their mobility and settle, every small parcel of arable soil could be made to yield food surpluses, especially when blocks and irrigation were introduced. Even if there were temporary downturns or even catastrophic failures, over the long term the odds were surely always struck in favor of those who could intensify land use to sustain evil lender and denser populations. And let, let's face it, the same skeptic might conclude the world's population could grow from, from, perhaps, from perhaps 5 million at the start of the Holocene to 900, to 900 million by AD 1800 and how to billion and how to billions because, because of agriculture. How to, for that matter, call such could such large populations be fed without change of, com of common to organize the masses, formal offices of leadership, full-time administrators, soldiers, police, and other non-food non producers, who in who in turn who in turn could be could could only be supported by the surpluses that agriculture provides. This seems like reasonable questions to ask, and those who make the first point almost invariably make the second. But in doing so, they risk parting company with just with history. You can simply jump from the beginning of the story to the end, and then just assume you then then just assume you know what happened in the middle. Well, you can, but then you are stepping back. To the very, very tales we've been dealing with throughout this book. So instead, let's recap very briefly what what we've learned about the origins and spread of farming, and then turn to examine some of the of the more dramatic things 
they actually did happen to human societies over the last 5,000 or some years. Farming, as we can now see, often started out as, a, as an economy of deprivation. You only invented it by there was nothing else to be done, which is why it tended to happen first in the areas in, in areas where where world resources were tedious on the ground. It was the one it was the odd one out in the strategies of the early Holocene, but it had explosive growth potential, especially after domestic livestock were added to the to cereal to cereal crops. Even so, it was the new kids it it was the new kid on the block. Since the first farmers were made were made more rubbish and often built houses of big mud, they were also more visible to archaeologists. That's one reason why imaginative in feeling is necessary if we want to avoid missing the action going on in much richer environments at the same time among populations still largely reliant of white resources. Seasonally erected monuments like those of Gobekli Tepe of Lake Sigirisko as, uh, as, are, as, are as clear a signal as one could wish for that for that big things were food among Holocene hunter fishes gatherers. But what well, uh, but but what were all the non farming people doing and where and where were they living for the rest of the time? Upland for forest areas like the uplands of the eastern Turkey or the foothills of the Urals as one the candidate, but since most construction was in wood, very little of this habitation survives. Most likely the largest communities were concentrated around the lakes rivers and coastlands and especially as at the downtowns, delta environments such as those of southern Mesopotamia, the lower reaches of the Nile and the Indus, where many of the worst first cities arose and to which we must now turn in order to find out exactly what living in large and densely populated settlements really did and did not imply for the development of human histories.